Here are a few clips from the news articles around the world in the last 30 days. A volcano erupted in Indonesia following a tsunami and an earthquake. Half a billion people in Asia are hungry. Climate genocide is coming, the United Nations warns. Shrinking forests, depleting oceans, mass wildlife loss, terrorism, and the list just never ends. Today, getting information from internet is like drinking from a fire hydrant. We easily get into an information fatigue. Hearing about any global problems is overwhelming. So it's no surprise that I often meet people who are very pessimistic about the world. They are worried how bad we did in the past with the wars and the diseases, how awful the present is with poverty and the pollution, and naturally, they are worried how hopeless the future will be. So this begs the question, how bad are we really doing? Is this the apocalyptic end of the world as we know it? And the short answer is no, absolutely not. It's not that more bad things are happening, it's just that we hear about them more often than we did before. There is this old proverb, a falling tree makes more noise than the growing forest. The truth is, today, right now, this moment, we are doing so much better than we ever did before in all of recorded history. And now when I say this, I mean on a global average without discrediting the millions of people who are still suffering and dozens of global problems we are yet to solve. But that doesn't negate the fact that we have made a lot of progress. So today, I want to take some time and convince you all how well the world is doing and what we as an individual can do to make it better. So let's start by looking some of the indicators that the world uses to measure human progress. Let's look at poverty, for instance, on a global scale as well as a national scale. Over the past few decades, poverty has steadily decreased. And when I look at child mortality, I see a similar extent of decrease. And go to malnutrition. There are more people that are healthy today than we had 50 years ago. And now when you look at other factors like literacy rate, it has increased steadily all over the world, as well as here in India. Look at total economic output, which is used to measure the world's progress in general. It has skyrocketed in the past. So as you can see, development has been happening globally everywhere. And experts like Steven Pinker and Hans Rosling, they have been using these tools to convince the world that we are actually doing better. But if this is the case, why do we feel like the world is in a terrible state? So for me, there are two reasons. One, technological advancement meant we are receiving the news so much faster. And negative news, they travel even faster. And two, as an individual, relating to global or national progresses or problems is overwhelming. We don't see where we fit in there. So if this is how the world did, if this is how India did, I wondered how my family has done in the same time frame. Now, both my parents, born in remote Indian villages, got access to school, and they were the first ones to attend college in their families. And eventually, they started their lives with $2.30 a day. But when me and my sister got educated and entered the workforce, our development, our individual development, increased tremendously. Now, this, to me, is not a story of one single family luckily escaping poverty. To me, this is a story of how personal hard work combined with huge national and international development efforts made progress possible. So when you look at this, in 1960s and 70s, there was Green Revolution in India, which probably enabled my grandparents to produce more output from their farmlands, combined with vaccination campaigns, social campaigns, let them send their children to school and college. And when me and my sister were born, there was increased security, improved education, improved health care, and combine that with the IT boom and economic progress India has made, that was the whole development that one family got. And now, I'm going to take the liberty to assume that might be the case for you as well. If you're listening to me to talk today, 
it means you had a means to travel and get here, or you have access to internet with a smartphone or a computer somewhere, you understand English, and chances are you are in decent health as well. But as we already saw, it's not the case for every single person on this world. So now that I have seen individual progress, my interest are to see how an individual can associate with the remaining problems. So let's start by looking what the world's plan is. These are the 17 colorful sustainable development goals that the world has put forward. Now, as I have just shown, the first goal, no poverty, was already taken care of me without me even having to try harder. Escaping poverty meant I had no hunger all my life, I had good health for the most part of my life, I had quality education, access to clean water, and I also got a decent job and good economic growth all throughout. Now, India's economic enormous efforts meant I had good infrastructure growing up and peace for the most part of my life. In my opinion, there are a couple of goals which are partially achieved, like gender equality and reduced inequality. So now, my question is, how can I, as an individual, at a personal level, contribute towards the progress for all in the existing as well as the remaining goals? And here, I'm going to show you some examples of how that could be done. So, in no poverty, this is the entire global population of 7 billion people. Out of the 7 billion, 1 billion is extremely rich. And there are 1 billion who are in extreme poverty even today. And there are 5 billion in the middle. So, if every one of us here have five friends, and we all join hands together to help just one person, just one, out of the bottom billion, extreme poverty would be for history books in no time. To give you a better perception, the average richest person on this planet is 100,000 times richer than I am today. Now, that lets us think, oh, the richest of the richest should be doing more for the poorest of the poor. But what we don't realize more often is I, as an individual in the middle, is 200,000 times richer than the poorest, average poorest person on this planet, 200,000. So this is just as much my responsibility as it is anyone else. So to give a real-world example of how we came to this realization, I joined hands with five of my friends, and a few years ago, we got uh, two motorbikes for a pastor living in a slum, taking care of 50 orphan children. Two years later, today, he has multiplied his income through the bikes, he has got an Uber, he employed three individuals from the same slum. To me, that is one billion, that's one person away from the bottom billion. And this took us no effort at all, just setting up an online fundraising page, reaching out to a few friends, asking for a few dollars. So contributing to the global goals should be easy, should be personal. To give you some more examples, when you look at quality education, all through my primary and secondary school, I had no access to toilet. There was no toilet in my school. Now, having no toilet at one end could mean a discomfort, but it's also a huge health hazard for thousands of children in this country around the world. So this year, we decided to build a toilet for one school. And building one toilet for one school by six people is easily doable when you start doing it. Take reduced consumption, for instance. Plastic pollution is frustrating for all of us. We see it everywhere, we see our animals eating it, and it took us time to realize we were just as part of the problem as the oil industry is by just using it. So three years ago, we decided we will quit plastics and never use it again. Or take life on land. Grazing farm animals, massive farm animals, require a lot of resources, a lot of water, there is a lot of deforestation, also, farm animals contribute more to greenhouse gases than all our transport system combined. So it's a great hazard in many different ways. Realizing this made me a vegan two years ago, and many of my friends have reduced eating meat. And climate action. Irony might have a field day when I say this. I just flew from Rome all the way to Kochi to tell you flying is really bad for the environment. 
But that's one thing I have always been guilty about. So what can I do? I track every single flight I have ever taken in my life and calculate my carbon dioxide output, my single one person output, to offset it as much as possible. Now, all these goals can be achieved when every single one of us pitch in a little bit. Now, I don't necessarily believe that every one of us should stop eating meat, should never go Diwali shopping again, should never buy new clothes again. But I do strongly believe every one of us can reduce our consumption just a little bit. We can fall back to the old Indian minimalist lifestyle. We can give a helping hand when somebody is in need. Now, not all of us can be or has to be Mother Teresa or Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King to fight a war against the causes we believe in. But we can choose and pick our battles. We can choose tiny little battles that is so easy to do that any one of us can do. And this collective effort is what that really matters. Individuals are just as important as national or international institutions in achieving any of these goals. And more importantly, acknowledging the success of the past is the hope that we need to face the challenges of the future. If we go back to 1700s and tell somebody that in 21st century, most people are living healthier, longer lives, wealthier lives, nobody would believe us. Humanity historically has made significant progress in addressing impossible tasks. And we have to acknowledge that and appreciate that for us to get the courage to face the challenges that still remain. And as cliched as this might sound, as Gandhi said, we have to be the change we want to see in the world. Someone somewhere, some time ago, did the same for us. And today, it's our turn to do the same. Thank you.